the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up, lacrosse fans? You're watching episode 225 of the Lax Factor Podcast. I'm your host, Ted Hoost, and today we are going to talk about the absolutely loaded Team USA roster. There was a bunch of people that were mad about some of the snubs, but keeping it positive, one thing that you can't argue is that this roster is is well put together. It seems that there was some thought put into the flow and to you know, um, making sure that they had all of the holes filled in terms of player type uh, and capabilities, and I think they went a little bit more with utility over specialty as it pertains to uh, a, a few things. So I want to dive into it here. As I always say, though, before I do, you can go to laxfactor.com and watch all of our videos, listen to the audio podcast. You can also support us by you know getting some t-shirts and generally being dope. And supporting us that way, we have all sorts of t-shirts, both Lax Factor related and just regular cool t-shirts. So, uh, And then share the crap out of the podcast with everybody, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. So let's dive into this now. And first, I want to go over that, you know, yes, there were some surprises here. And I don't, you know, when I look at it, I think the biggest surprise offensively was Kieran McArdle being on the team. And not because Kieran McArdle's not a, a filthy lacrosse player and insanely productive. Um, I think that there was just other names that people know a little bit more both at the, the the high levels of college and at the PLL and you know people were surprised some of these dudes didn't make the team and guys like maybe Pinnell and McArdle did I, I think that defensively they for the most part got it right I think that you know in, in the specialty positions short stick D mid face offs they, they nailed all those too but uh, let's dive into the roster the makeup and then we can debate here and there, you know, does everybody on this roster deserve to be there? My answer is going to be yes. Spoiler, yes. Uh, but I just want to talk about maybe what went into some of the decisions and some of the the snubs, like the why behind those. So to start out here, McArdle and Pinnell. I want to highlight just kind of by player type first, and I, because I think that's largely what went into this. McArdle, true 50-50 threat utility. He can do everything. He'll finish a little bit off ball. He can carry. He can feed. McArdle can do everything. And you're going to see they're kind of looking for that type of player, I believe, in this roster because you only have a 23-man roster, so you need to kind of take utility over specialization at times. So I like McArdle as a pick because he can do everything. He can fill a million different holes. He can beat his defender and score a goal, and he can help his friends out. Pinnell, Similar reason, you know, like once again, he can anchor an offense, he can quarterback an offense. Now, I think you could make the argument that let's say you could put an aim at in over either of these two guys. These guys are veterans, though. And these guys are not the Amet by any means is one dimensional. I had always said Amet can score goals with the best of best of them. It's just he's so much better at orchestrating an offense and getting other guys points. It, it, that's what he does. You could make the argument with that with both of these guys, they they're a little bit more capable of knifing you with goals. And I'd say the same about Sowers. Sowers was always an assist heavy player through college. You look at his stats last PLL year though: twenty one goals, eleven helpers. The young guys can run. So even you know. What you end up seeing with a lot of the young, um, young pros is that you know, yes, yeah, Sowers was a do all attackman, a true 50 50 attackman in college. In the PLL last year, the dude was scoring goals, and that's because he's young, more athletic, has legs, he's going to be able to get himself opened up a little more. So, I think with th these two spots and with Sowers, I think they were trying to go with guys that could do it all that were just as capable of dro as dropping at dropping dimes on dudes' sticks as they're cutting as they were of scoring goals. And I like the veteran picks up here with McArdle and Pinnell. I like the pick with Sowers here to kind of fill in both at attack and get some midfield runs as well. And I think that's the other kicker, Sowers can kind of dodge from all over the field. Can You could bring him out of the box and have him run midfield. Maybe Amet doesn't have that same utility, at least not in the coach's eyes overall. Now, Rambo, no-brainer here. You need a veteran that can score goals in crunch time, that can dodge and create offense when you really need someone to kind of muscle themselves in and do that. I love Rambo in this spot too because he doesn't demand the ball 
to put points up. He doesn't have to have the ball in a stick a bunch to put points up. So I think Rambo was a no-brainer in terms of veteran leadership, and you want a guy in crunch time that can score you a goal. There is no one better in the sport of lacrosse at scoring goals in crunch time than Rambo. Now, yes, he's starting to age a little bit up, but I, you know, that that's okay in these world games with the mix of youth and veterans that they have on this roster. So I like that pick. Um, I, I've seen some people chirping these two picks here, uh, Bertrand and O'Neill offensively. And the reason being, if we come down here and we see who got snubbed, Holman, Sam Handley. So if you're looking for guys that can play both midfield and maybe run some attack in key situations that you would need, obviously O'Neill's there and O'Neill's got experience running a little bit of midfield at Duke as a freshman and obviously as an attackman as well. Um, you know, most notably an attackman here. But, you know, you look at, they left Holman off. They left Handley off. Now, I think Handley and O'Neill, because they're both beasts, I think they're the most closely related. So you could make the argument here, okay, why O'Neill over Handley? And I think the reason might be Handley is an incredible dodger, has an incredible step-down shot. O'Neill is both of those things as well. I think O'Neill may excel a little bit more off-ball than Handley, you know, because if you're looking for midfielders or, or a guy that could play both midfield and attack, obviously Handley is that guy as well. But I, I think O'Neill might be a little bit provide a little bit more utility than Handley off ball, and that may be the oh, that maybe that didn't play at all. This is just my observation. You know, do I think Handley's an overall better player right now at this stage of his career than O'Neill? Yes, I, I think so. But. O'Neal, you know, is also playing on a team where he's got a little bit more offensive depth around him, and, you know, that changes what he ends up having to do, and then also Handley's a midfielder. So I think I like this pick because of the utility he provides, both as he could play attack, he can dodge from midfield, but I think he's a little bit better off ball in cutting situations. I think he, he has a little bit more range in terms of covering the field as an off ball player, and I think that may be one of the reasons he was picked. Now, Bertrand, over guys like Holman and Schellenberger. That one I don't get as much. Um, once again, not that Bertrand doesn't deserve to be in there. He absolutely does. Uh, but I think maybe they're just looking for a, a true kind of goal-scoring threat. And Bertrand, 18 goals, no helpers last season. So that may be the utility he provides. Maybe it's a role-playing concept. I don't know. that. I think if you could make an argument, I, I would the, the picks that I would chirp the most would be Pinnell, because I think you could pop even a Schellenberger in there at this point, and the youth of a Schellenberger would be really solid as kind of a 50-50 anchor for an offense, and the utility overall, I think Schellenberger's a little bit better off-ball maybe than Pinnell, so I, I could have saw that pick. But listen, Pinnell had an incredible season last year. I was prepared to start calling for his retirement at the beginning of the PLL season last year, and he shut me the fuck up on that front. So, you know, no arguing here that Pinnell was worthy of a spot, not to mention the experience he brings and the number of times he's wore this Team USA jersey is, is, is you know, ridiculous. So that makes sense. Uh, Holman, similar thing here. You could kind of plug any of these guys out. You could take Bertrand out and plug Holman in, but there's something about Bertrand these guys like, and, and uh, you know, that's that. You know, I, I don't see – there's not much use in crying over the snubs here because when you look at the the nine offensive guys they have, they fit they fit well. Now, I haven't even talked about the midfielders yet. Now, if we get into Ryan Conrad, Connor Kelly, and Tom Schreiber, I've heard people kind of chirping these picks to a degree also. But Conrad, you put him in for the utility, you know, in terms of he can play wings on faceoffs if called upon. He's not going to be because they have incredible defensive midfielders as well on this roster that could probably anchor that much better. Ryan Tarafanko and uh, 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 Richards and Logan, you know, those guys are incredible like that. But I like Ryan Conrad for his overall utility. The dude can put up points. The dude can dodge. Uh, he's not going to, once again, be one of those players that demands the ball to be able to be productive. And then more importantly, with these two, and then also even, I'd say, you can make the argument with uh, O'Neal a little bit, you need some range shooters. Connor Kelly definitely brings that as an offensive threat, and he you know, he can stretch a defense by being able to drop the two-point bombs. Now, I don't. there's not two-point bombs in world lacrosse or anything like that, but just in terms of being able to stretch a defense, camp out top, make sure that the defense out top the help side, the back side defense that's helping low as the balls at X. These dudes make sure that you have to pay attention. Schreiber and Connor Kelly and Brennan O'Neill 
as well. All of them are threats from deep. O'Neal doesn't have experience dropping deuces, but I bet you by the time he's a PLL player, he will be in the area of two to four uh, uh, two-point goals every season because the dude can just bring heat from distance. So I like the I like the mix here. Uh, Ryan Conrad definitely for two, you know, utility overall, and then Kelly and Schreiber. Uh, both goal scoring threats. Schreiber more of a 50 50 threat from the midfield, which is incredible. But both of the, all three of these guys, O'Neill, Kelly, and Schreiber, can all bring the heat from deep. Face offs, not even going to debate this here. TD Erland didn't have the best year last year, but you could just put these guys on the Team USA roster for the next, you know, four, six iterations, and I would be completely pleased with that. I both love them as players, as personalities, but more importantly, I like them together. They're like stepbrothers. They're best friends. I don't. I know they're really not, but that's how I see them in terms of the competition, and uh, they used to put on the field here and used to do the way they used to do battle in the college game. I loved it. So I'll take these guys at face off, Trevor Baptiste and TD Erlen, all day long. I forgot I didn't even use their names uh, for the people who are listening only. Short stick D-mids. Man, you know, you, you look at these guys. These guys are fine. Zach Goodrich, Danny Logan, Jacob Richard, Ryan Tarafanko, all more than capable short stick D-mids. You could sit here and we can go down into the uh, – I, I don't think I wrote about it here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So on the defensive side here, polls I'm completely cool with, but one thing I did mention here was snubs like Ty Warner. They're not going to end up being a big deal. Yes, Ty Warner's probably the best, better cover man. You could even make the argument Warner's a better cover man or as good as any of these guys, if not better. But you can say Tarafanko. I, I think all four of these guys in all provide a little bit more two-way utility than what Warner would bring to the table. And I think that's obviously when you have a 23-man roster, you gotta got to go with utility. And I think they got it right with these guys. I mean, shit, look at Logan. He had three two-point goals. That's pretty dope. And then uh, Tarafanko, you know, eight points here. So you go with points between Danny Logan and Tarafanko, and then utility overall still there for both Goodrich and uh, uh, Richards. And then LSM, Burns, and Earhart. Yeah. That's pretty dope. They only have four close defensemen in Bernhardt, Dunn, Giles Harris, and Rowlett. I love all of those picks. I like the LSM picks here. Not even going to talk about any snubs because it doesn't matter. And then we get down into the goalie range here, Jack Kelly and Blaze Reardon. I will say this, and I talk about it down at this here. Reardon was a no-brainer, obviously. Kelly surprised me a bit more just because his save percentage in the PLL last year was much lower than some of the other guys that tried out, Concanon being the one that I was surprised. Now, I'm basing a lot of what I did, what I thought, who I thought was going to make the team just on last season's statistics, either at the college level or the PLL level. Concanon had the second highest save percentage in the PLL last year, 55% compared to Kelly's 46%. But obviously the coaching staff likes Kelly, went with Kelly here, and Reardon is a no-brainer. And I really like Reardon for those games, you know, for instance, against Team Canada. And Reardon just, it's incredible to see what he's done, you know, coming out of Albany. And I love the fact that uh, he, he was playing offense in, in the NLL while playing goalie in the PLL. And he was insanely good at both levels, but just one of the best goalies to do it at the pro level right now. So that was a no-brainer. Um, so that those that, I just wanted to talk about it quickly here, but I think that overall I like the I like any of these. You you could sit here and kind of start mixing and matching units here. I mean, you say even if the the starting attack was McCardle, Pinnell, and Rambo, I that's a really good attack unit. But then you could start popping in, you know, pop out uh, McCardle or Pinnell. You pop in Sowers. You know, you could take out uh, Rambo and pop uh, Brennan O'Neill over there on that left side. I mean. The utility they're going to have where they'll probably have a five-man rotation on attack, at least a four-man rotation on attack. I'm almost positive we'll see Sowers down there. I wouldn't be surprised to see a little, you know, a few runs here and there for O'Neal. And then you start looking at the midfield lines here. You know, obviously these would be your, in essence, your top two midfield lines. Here's one and here's another. And I, I would suspect that they'll mix them up a little bit. I bet you would end up seeing Sh maybe Schreiber anchor a line and Kelly anchor a line, and then they'd mix these other guys in. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how they mix and match and how they put that all together because they're, you know, nine offensive guys is all they have to make do with. So it's not a whole lot, but I don't know. That's it. I'm going to stop rambling about it here. I am going to have a Christmas episode come out, so I will record uh, the Chris the Sunday episode on Saturday. So, yes, come back Sunday, Christmas morning. I will be here. So as your kids are sitting around 
uh, playing with their toys. You can watch a little bit of lacrosse podcast action. I don't know what I'm going to talk about yet here. I think I'm going to try to do a team pre, a couple of team previews, look at a couple of schedules, things like that. I'm going to keep it light and airy, and uh, that'll be that. But thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And the new, sorry, I'm, I keep coming back and talking still. Uh, the new format here, we're going to go, I'm going to try to do a show every Wednesday, more just general news. I'm going to try to do a specialty show every Sunday. And then every Friday, we're going to have film reviews. So always hit up YouTube uh, on Wednesdays, YouTube or Spotify, if you're looking at video um, for Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. I'm going to try to put shows out every week, starting now through to the end of the college season on Wednesdays, Fridays, Sundays. Wednesdays, Fridays, Sundays. Keep that in your head. So I will be back Friday, technically. If you want to come back to YouTube and just see the film review, that will be dropped on Friday. And then on Sunday, Christmas morning, you can watch the uh, episode 226 on Christmas morning. So, all right, I'm shutting the hell up. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And Hoost is out. The Lax Factor Podcast.